Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Raf Rakuten Group CEO and Chairman Vicky Mikitani. Okay, good morning, uh, and thank you for uh, coming and joining uh, to Rakuten and Rakuten Symphony Goose. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Rakuten Group, uh, as well as the chairman of Rakuten Symphony. Uh, I just wanted to uh, let you know that we made a, one of the, uh, I think, the most uh, disruptive announcement yesterday about the uh, operator access network. Uh, because I am thinking something is wrong in this industry. That now, as you may know, uh, we started this, ju this journey about six years ago. Uh, really, nobody we really believe the virtualization or radio access network is going to work. I talked with uh, big CEOs, big telecom companies, and uh, they were not skeptical, but they didn't believe in it at all. But uh, we were, you know, ignorant enough, maybe. Uh, we were the challenger, uh, so we have decided to really take off this journey uh, to democratize the wireless mobile network. Looking back on when I started uh, Rakuten Group as the world first internet marketplace company in the world, nobody really believed uh, people will ever buy anything on the internet. Uh, this was just 27 years ago, and at that time, internet speed was 14.4 kbps. It was extremely slow. Fast forward, Rakuten Group now has over 70 different businesses in many, many countries. We are dominant in e-commerce, you know, uh, online travel agency business, uh, the uh, advertisement, uh, FinTech, we're number one uh, credit card company, uh, number one online banking, number one brokerage firm, number one online insurance company in Japan. And to be very honest, the last business I wanted to do was mobile business because it requires so much money and capital to build a network, and I thought it is going to be very difficult to really, you know, uh, get enough return out of it. But I changed my mind for two reasons. One is now all this wireless connectivity were becoming too expensive, and in most countries it was oligopolized or monopolized by a few players, and they were in a very good country though. So I think we, have, we need to have some, uh, some disruptions to make sure that everybody in the world can access to the wireless network without any limitation, with a high quality, at a reasonable cost. So how can we do it? And we came up with the idea that we should not really follow the conventional approach, but really make technological breakthrough, which we call virtualization. Now fast forward, uh, we launched Rakuten Mobile based on Rakuten Symphony technology, not only for radio access network, but for uh, core uh, you know, uh, cloud, and also operating support system. It's all we made by and developed by our internal uh, engineers of the Rakuten Symphony. So we are very different from all these companies around here because we are probably the only one company which has two things. One is mobile business, and second is mobile software, network software company. So that's the uh, biggest difference between us and other companies. Thus, we really believe uh, all run software is way more mature and advanced than any other competitor. But I still thought this is something is wrong. Everybody is developing the same software. You know, the uh, network equipment companies, uh, some of the software companies, everybody is developing the same software. But the objective of open radio access is really this bundle, hardware and software. So uh, we have decided to license out our uh, probably the most mature or um, software for 4G, 5G, SA, NSA, uh, for femto, for Wi-Fi, for 
EMBT for you know any NBIOT, uh, we decided to we basically license up to the companies whoever want to use our software. Uh, I hope this will be really change uh, the direction of the industry, uh, and uh, we want to really make sure that we going to make a big disruption so that everybody in the world have a very high quality, very reasonable uh, the wireless network, not only in Japan, but in other parts of the world as well. Uh, today, uh, we have the uh, honor to uh, have uh, one of our most important uh, clients uh, from uh, one of the British, Mike Martin. Uh, thank you for joining. Arigatou uh, gozaimasu. And uh, as you know, there are only uh, two you know, successful online deployment in the world, I believe. One is uh, Rapid Mobile, and the other is one in uh, British. And I, I hope uh, Mike uh, will share uh, his you know, thoughts and, and uh, perspective about uh, this journey. Uh, we also announced uh, that uh, we are going to deploy uh, Aura uh, in uh, UK, uh, partnering with QStar, uh, which is owned by the company called Beyond. And uh, we also uh, signed uh, LOI uh, with uh, Now Communications in EPV. So uh, I think we are making very, very steady progress. Uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to you. No, James. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nithi. So, on the 8th of December 2023, Europe's most modern mobile network became fully functional. The commercial service launch of One on One's network represented a watershed moment for telecommunications globally and cemented One on One's status as a pioneer in German mobile and globally in telecom. Next up, we're going to be treated to a very special session in which we will hear about how One on One's unique network architecture was designed and the promise it holds for the future. It's my great pleasure now to welcome our first special guest panelist. Please put your hands together for the CEO of One on One Mobile Fund, Michael Martin. Thank you very much, Michael. Please also put your hands together for the Chief Business Officer of Rakuten Symphony, Rabia hey, Debussy. Can we do a very clap for my please? <laughs> and I'm also delighted to introduce our moderator for today's session, Roy Chua, the founder and principal of Avid I'll hand over to you, Roy. Thank you, James. Really appreciate it. Well, it's an like exciting time to be here at Mobile World Congress. And as an analyst, you know, you always look for the cool things, not the things that are the same as before, right? And and I think it, I'm delighted to be here with Rafa Ten and, and Mike from One and One because I think they are breaking new ground. They're making changes, as Nikki was saying. And I think we need change in the industry. Otherwise, we'll never move forward. So I think, you know, appreciation to the companies that are pioneers in driving change forward. So with that, let's 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 ask a couple of questions of Mike, and you know, I think we can all learn from it, right? I think you know, when when we're pioneers, there's going to be experiences and learning, and there's going to be changes and advances. So now, with one of the one, you achieve you know fixed wireless access you know in 2022, full mobility in 2023. So can you tell us about the capabilities and the experiences that one in one mobile network is now achieving, and how are you working to provide a better experience? for your German customers, for consumers and enterprises. Okay. So maybe to start, we, uh, we started our journey with, with Rakuten in 2021 uh, when we signed our contract and we decided that we go together. And, and what we did since then was, first of all, I think in a record time, building a network out of nothing. So it, it would be hard enough to do it with legacy technology. But we did, we did it, you know, it wasn't difficult enough. We, we decided to go the, the old Moran way. Um, and what have been our achievements until then? We started our first service in the network with FWA, which is pretty basic data service. Uh, even after, what was it? After one and a half years, uh, something like that, starting from scratch, we started with, with FWA in, Dece in December 2022. 2022. Um, 
FWE was, was our proof of concept more or less. So we, we have proven that our technology is working, that the, the combination of software in, in the radio domain with former Altsystem and Arcoden combined with Mervenier and orchestrated by Arcoden is working. Um, and then we did the next step, uh, which was the much more complicated one. We brought mobile services to all our customers. Now you might know that uh, we, we still have not many active antennas. We, uh, there we are a bit lagging behind, but having antennas is just scaling effect. The much, much more difficult part was getting the core network running, getting the, the, the DUs, the CUs integrated, and getting all software uh, working together across 80 vendors. So we have 80 partners we are working with. We have not only, you know, it's not like legacy is who work with one partner. We have 80 partners that need to be orchestrated, concentrated, and, um, and, and aligned together. And I'm happy that this job is not done by me. This job is done by, by them, this gentleman and by Rakuten. They are orchestrating all our partners and, and bringing the technology together. And what have we achieved? We achieved um, that we have created a home for 12 million customers. So maybe that's something that is not broadly known. We are building a new network, yes, completely new, greenfield from the scratch, but we have 12 million customers already uh, since, accumulated since the last 10, 15 years. So we are total brownfield um, company building a greenfield network, which means all the complexity of our 12 million customers we bring to our network and, and we build a total modern new network with all the old functions. And so far I need to say I'm I'm really happy. We have now, we started on the 8th of December, we bring in uh, thousands of customers every day, uh, all the new customers are coming into our network, and so far it's running really stable and good. Yeah, I think what you made an important point, which is that you know there, there is a scale element to it, and there is the validation of the stack. And I think there's a lot of hard work in validating the stack. And that, you know, with 80 partners in terms of the open ecosystem. The good news about an open and diverse ecosystem is it's open and it's diverse, right? The bad news is that there is open and diverse. Yes. You can bring it all together and make it work. And I think that's the hard part. And once you validate the stack, then it's just a scaling factor, right? It's just once the architecture is validated, the business processes, operational processes are validated, then it's a scaling, right? And then I think that, that's important. I think that's a point a lot of people miss. I, I can make one comment, uh, you know, if somebody from a brownfield operator's got fear of open run, I can tell you open run is not, is not your problem. Open run is not, open run is a solution, but it's not the problem. Right. When you build a new network, you have the same problems that you have everywhere. We, we have, I'm looking at colleagues' faces here, we have MTU sizes uh, that are not aligned between elements, right? And then we have uh, transport links going down. You have that with every network. Open run is not the problem. Open run is the solution here, uh, and it's helping you getting better. Uh, but you still have your regular day-to-day, -day, you know, problems that you have in a new network. No, it doesn't go away. So I think you know, back to the ecosystem, right? You know, yeah. what's the benefit of this diverse and open ecosystem, right? What has all these partners brought you? And I'm looking at you. I'm also looking at Ravi because that's one of your partners right there. Right? Possibilities, I would say. Right? Choices. Uh, we did our choice in the beginning. We we had we, we have chosen our, our partnerships in the beginning, and we, we started off with them. Which doesn't necessarily mean we will go forever in that, uh, in, in that partnerships that we have currently. So if we see some, and it's not only about commercials, right? It's not about negotiating the one with the That's that's boring. That's that's not the. Of course, it's a side effect, but it's it's more about the technology. If we have a partner that is offering a better technology in future, why, why shouldn't we look at it and, and try to explore it and eventually adopt it in the future? So um, I'm not bound to, to any vendor. I'm not bound to any partner. Uh, I, I can take the, the best of the world if, if I wish. Um, the only the only real 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 big partnership. Uh, I'm happy about is having it with Akuten because they are doing the, all those integrations of, of our wishes. Um, and maybe also to add to that, we are, it's not like we take the choice, we want that vendor, that vendor, it's always a, a, a common effort, it's always a common goal, and we basically we are working as one company. It's a partnership. So I'd like to go back to the principle. The slogan you see up here, Telecom Reinvented, is not just words on the wall. 
the human race has gone through improvements in every aspect of life from the moment we existed. We've seen it in utilities and energy, we've seen it in transportation, we've seen it in IT and tech, and we've seen that transformation from a distributed data center in every enterprise to a centralized approach offered as a service called cloud. We've seen it transform all of the data links and all the communication links, submarine, terrestrial, or satellite. We believe the telco industry requires such transformation and such reinvention. For the last 30 years, and I've been in this industry for 28 of them, for the last 30 years we keep repeating the same mechanism and the same approach. I attended, this is my 23rd Mobile World Congress, I missed 2020 because it was canceled. I attended 20, 2000 in camp. There were about 20 suppliers of major radio components and networks for mobile space. Today we have a handful. So something has to change and that something is now ready. And that readiness is driven by the industry needs and demands. This is the background. What Mike was talking about in diversity and democratization is exactly the flexibility as a mobile operator is exactly that flexibility that gives him the advantage. It gives him the faster time to market, the lower barrier of entry, and the ability to leverage standard open technology. Cuts hardware, open virtualized systems, standard Linux operating system, Kubernetes and containerization, and network functions only softwareized and virtualized on top of that. If we have a challenge in any component, we try to fix it. And if we can't fix it, we replace it. The network becomes a building block of smaller pieces of tech that helps us address the challenges and the issues, but also address customer demands and business strategies and objectives. Amen. Amen. I think very, very well said. I think, you know, I. You brought up some of the elements, I think, that underlie the network architecture at one and one in Rapid Mobile. And the other thing I want to point out is that in the partner that you had with Rapid Ten is not just a software vendor, it's not just a system integrator, it's someone who actually has experience running a similar network at scale as well. And I think that experience is valuable and important as they work with you. I think that's what I'm seeing as well. Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, Rapid Ten is running a network in Japan with a density in Tokyo that uh, we, we don't have in Germany, right? We have big cities, yes, uh, but we, have, we don't have that, that density. And, and that also gave us the confidence that, you know, the system is working. It's, it's uh, obviously, it is a pioneering is one of the challenges, and, and we faced not one issue, we faced multiple times, uh, you know, situations where we said, how can we move forward? But um, it's all about partnering, finding the right partner, and finding the right uh, approach. Maybe to add on your uh, on this on this story that um, software and hardware was always coupled in telecommunication industry. So I'm, I'm now 44. Since I'm working, it was always you, you buy one box. In IT industry, it was never like that. So you never went and bought a, a PC from them, and then you needed to have a a, a work you know, or an offer. Uh, uh, office um, application from Dell. Nobody thought about it. You have Microsoft combined with Dell. And now finally, telecom industry is, is doing the same, decoupling hardware and software. And, and I think that's the way forward. And that's the beauty of choices. That's, that's the beauty that we have. Um, and we haven't even started leveraging it. We only build our network. We only we had the very first step. Um, we're really looking forward to, to what we will learn next year. So, I think that's good. And I think what you just brought up are elements of the architectural solution architecture, right? The openness, the disaggregation um, of software and hardware. So in terms of network architecture, you know, what are the key elements in terms of the solution architecture here, and I think for both of you, and why is that important in laying that groundwork for the future? So I, think, um, I, I can start with that. So Rakuten is unique in the industry. Rakuten comes from a background uh, IT services and businesses that got transformed and digitalized. Our, our fame comes from Japan, but our intentions and visions is to really transform industries across the globe through demonstrating models that are better than the past. 
There's nothing wrong with that. We again go back. This is a human nature. You have to improve continuously every day, every year, every day. So we believe that the industry was lagging behind. This architecture that builds on open technologies, whether it's the hardware infrastructure, the transport IP networking, or all of the applications that serve the customers for mobility, for handover, for messaging, for security, all of them become software elements that are so small that you could expand. This is called elasticity and, and technical lingo. You could expand and shrink as your customers' needs expand and shrink. You have a mobile network, you have a, a mobile customer base that is always moving, that is always doing something different. Sometimes they do more, sometimes they do less. You can't have a network etched in stone and reliant on big monolithic hardware that requires forklift, throw out, upgrade in every generation you deploy. Additionally, this the ability to go and fix problems through open systems. We have a community Yes, it's 82 partners in the network. And we do have a lot more in Japan when we did it the first time. So you always do your job better when you do it second time. It's, it's nature. So when you have such ecosystem, yes, it's difficult to manage. But those ecosystem players are as hungry as we are. We come from the same culture, the same mentality. We are fed up and tired of an environment that is etched in stone extremely expensive and limited to a handful of suppliers around the world. That has to change. And when I started talking with Mike and his team at the time, we started in, um, in mid-2020, in fact, September 28, 2020, we had the first exchange. And they were going down the path of selecting what every mobile operator would select. I said, give us a chance to share with you what we've done. And that's the uniqueness of Rakuten. Rakuten is not a telco vendor. Rakuten is a mobile operator by its own rights in its own domestic market. We know the pain, we know the challenges, and we know the rewards that mobile operators go through every day. But at the same time, because we're digital innovators, we wanted to take this model to the rest of the world. If you have proven, and I wouldn't say it was good enough for it, yes, the network is good enough and the performance is good enough, and the answer is no, it is not. It is much better. It is much better in such a shorter period of time. And this is not my claim. This is third-party analysis. Go check out all the KPI reports, the drive test, the open signal, the income routes. There's tons of reports that compare the network in Japan against the incumbents. And we're starting to get very early signs, and I'd like Mike to to, uh, to uh, mention those early indicators of amazing performance and success. Yes, we're still early in the deployment. Yes, we are going through the teething pain of a toddler growing into a teenager, growing into an adult. It's nature, every network goes through this. But we will get there because the early indicators are impressive. Maybe to add on that, I worked a lot with the traditional vendors, right? And often was impressed by their speed of fixing issues. But what I learned here is, um, you know, I'm not going to tell you that we have no issues. We, we, we have issues like every every operator has, especially when you start a new network. But the speed of issue resolution, that is the impressive thing here. And um, it's often, you know, the debate if Open RAN has or features parity with, with legacy systems or not. I think that's not, that's not the question, if we have now feature parity or not. We will overtake. Open RAN will overtake the, the the legacy because it's much faster adapting and accelerating and fixing issues. Uh, although not fast enough for me, but still fast, faster than. Keep us on our toes, Mike. Yeah. Keep calling me in the middle of the night. I have Are no we? problem with that. <laughs> well, that's very good. Speaking of calling each other in the middle of the night, which, yeah. and I was, maybe maybe that's not the best way to present it. But in terms of. Um, lessons learned, right? I think, you know, there's probably people out there in other carriers, right? You know, whether they're you know, incumbents or whether they're trying to break in, what has been the sort of the key lessons that you've learned and how can those lessons help them in terms of accelerating the path to a more modern network, right? And that this obviously comes to both of you because, it, again, represents not only a provider of solutions, you run a mobile network. Likewise, one-on-one, -on -one, you're breaking in, you've accelerated, you've done a deployment at, at speed, right, with 
you know, obviously the system be a partner there. What are the lessons learned? And if there's a carrier out there that's looking and saying, okay, maybe I want to take the lead, right? Uh, what should I know before? I think it's nothing that, that we learned. It's it's a um, confirmation of what we expected. So we we expected it will be challenging to keep this this uh, partner ecosystem of 80 82 partners uh, aligned, informed, you know, uh, on their toes. Um, it's not a learning. It's a confirmation. That that is really critical uh, and, and mission critical. You need to to have a, a working partnership with all of your partners. But it's not a new learning, it's, uh, it's something. What else have I learned? I learned that, um, as I said, that the speed of fixing issues is impressive. It's much more impressive in a software-based only world than in my past where everything was bound to hardware and, and then, oh, I need to exchange the hardware, it takes me another three months or so. No, I've, I've never heard of anything like that because it's all standard hardware here. And um, that's, my, that's my positive learning. Indeed, I don't have any negative learning, right? Like, if you start a new network, I can only recommend you to do testing, 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 testing. And, and if you think you're done with testing, then start again. And start again and test again. Test all your devices. We have 8,000 device types in our uh, customer base. We tested majority of them. I would everybody who starts thinking in that direction, plan enough time for testing. You will find issues that you need to resolve. Uh, but, but you will be succeeding in the resort of that. On, on the business side, uh, the foundational elements, of what, what drove Rakuten to do this? And again, with Ice and Ice, Lilish, what drove them to really believe in this is the fact that we're both challengers entering into a nation with three formidable uh, incumbents. So let's say you're building a restaurant if your cost structure of building a restaurant is identical to the restaurant beside you that serves the same food, this is no good business. You've got to cost optimize your network, your environment, and your business cost so you can compete, so you can be better. This is one element. The second element, if you're going to perform at the same level, if your food is going to taste the same, it's going to look the same, what is the differentiation? So you got your, you got to push yourself and challenge yourself to do better on performance, better on service assurance, better on customer experience. And last but not least, this flexibility. In the old days, you take a big Carrara marble, whatever your heart wishes, maybe not Carrara, you etch everything in stone. In order for changes, good luck, you've got to lift it and throw it away and do it again. In this environment, we have nothing but software. And that agility allows us, with the architecture that is so unique, to distribute very interesting applications to the edge of the network. Because the compute systems that are running the workloads are now fully open. You, take, you can't take a legacy baseband unit and deploy on it a finance application, a gaming application. You simply can't. This architecture allows this flexibility you have now thousands and thousands of endpoints that can reach your customers, not just for connectivity coverage and performance, but for applications and services unheard of in the legacy environment over the 20th years. Maybe to add on that, uh, the, the architecture that we're building together is exactly combining what you said now. I mean, to, to repeat for everyone how we build our network, all our base stations, are connected with fiber, so there's no such thing like microwave. We all connect everything with fiber. And we are building more than 500 regional data centers that are hosting former known DBU uh, functionalities on normal POTS hardware uh, in, those, in those more than 500 data centers. Now, since we anyway need to build those 500 data centers across Germany, we said, okay, let's, let's build them a bit bigger. Let's simply uh, um, plan three, four, five racks additionally which we don't know what we, what we will use them for currently, but we will be able to host in the future whatever real-time service you might need. You know, may it be DNS, may it be CDN, whatever comes across, we can host directly in our 500 data centers and have a, a, a fiber connection to our antenna, which is never more away than 10 kilometers. So think about that. You always have a, a, a latency of two, three milliseconds, for every 
for every service that you deploy in your DU. You don't need to go the whole way up to CDC. No, you can just answer it in the DU. And that flexibility is here because the architecture is giving it. Um, as a power grid operator, I don't know who is going to start building 500 data centers in Germany without having any need. So that is, that is the beauty of, of what we build. And into that infrastructure requirement, we are able to, to flange in software wherever we need. Looking forward to a to bright future, whatever may come. I'd like to call on the industry professionals, experts in tech, business leaders, CEOs, vendors, innovators, mobile operators. Join us in this journey. This is the future. We can't do it with a handful of companies around the world. We need the ecosystem to grow. But first, you need to believe that this is good for you and good for the industry. Second, you need to understand exactly the details behind that so that you can dig them. And third, you've got to really take the action. It's an opportunity for so many tech firms and so many businesses around the world to be the early entrants and adopters of such an innovative approach to building mobile networks and offering mobile services. So I think what, uh, what you're pointing out is that we're, what we're seeing is a sort of a new platform. And I think, Robbie, what struck me when you said you know, earlier around the incumbents and the legacy processes is that you have these technology aspects. And I would say it's not just technology, it's, it's the whole sort of platform aspect. It's a combination of the business processes, the architecture, you know, the practices around it. And the existing ones will only take us so far. You, know, you can only get incremental and very small gains with future investment. You have to jump the curve, right? And I think what I'm hearing from both of you is in fact, this is the next platform, the next curve, if you will, right? As you will. And from there, there is investment, there's upfront work. But at the right time, when you hit an inflection point, there's a lot of opportunities. And you've done a lot of the hard work. You've benefited from some of that hard work. And you know, I'm not saying it's easy either, right? But in terms of the learning, the next one that comes along, it's going to be easier because you can write on the lessons and the platforms and the architectures that you have laid out. And I think, you know, what I was saying is that you've got 500 million data centers, right? What can you do with 500 million data centers? Probably a lot. Yeah, so maybe just to wrap up, just to maybe give people a sort of a vision of possibilities, right, as it were, do you have some examples of that in terms of what we can dream of on this? The next well, um, um, I'm very down to ground with, you know, I will not start now talking about uh, self-driving cars and things like that, this, you know, this is all stories. But, but um, we have a network built for residential customers only, so one-on-one -on -one customer base is, is not B2B, it's just residential. Um, and there it's not so easy to find appealing use cases for real-time services, but there are some, like uh, real-time gaming is, is one, uh, one of the uh, use cases for residential, or take it even simpler, um, I can bring the content of you in my network to wherever you are. Let's assume I am storing my pictures and videos, my personal stuff, uh, somewhere on the cloud. I could program my cloud that when I'm at home in Düsseldorf, uh, my, my content is hosted, at my base station, at my um, uh, original data center close to my base station. But then I take the train, go to Munich, and appear in Munich, and network recognizes now he's in Munich. I'm going to transfer his pictures, his videos to Munich, so that it's hosted there. Maybe you know, not not a, uh, just an example to give you to give you a perspective of what could be possible. My content in Germany is driving with me everywhere I go. It doesn't need to be sent across. The, uh, the, the country, it is simply there, and, and forever you, uh, for whatever use case you might think of, you could think of DNS resolution, Resolu resoluting your DNS addresses directly on the edge, gives you much better customer experience, and um, yeah, there will be much more, many more coming, I don't want to give them all away now. Yeah, not yet, right, and not until you monetize them. <laughs> yeah. No need to reveal secrets and predict, but one thing we know is this architecture allows unique services, digital services and experiences to be pushed at the edge at a performance level that is unheard of. We know the 5G promise is all about ultra low latency and the ability to slice and segment different quality service, different experiences. This is fantastic. But what you can run on top of that 
the sky is the limit in these digital services. You mentioned gaming, but think of trading. With that ultra low latency, you could do magic with trading. You could be improving businesses, you could be having a trade house that is so differentiated, making so much money on daily thousands and thousands, maybe millions of trades. So there is unlimited healthcare and education. There's so many use cases that will evolve. But the ecosystem has to grow. When we released 2.5G, we had very dumb mobile devices, which is basic access with WAP, if anybody at all is old enough to remember that. And then we go to the 3G, and experiences have changed. Devices have changed. So it's not just the network, it's the ecosystem. We go to 4G, now you have you have the ability to do some AR, VR experience. Imagine when 5G proliferation and next 6G with this advanced open architecture, with new devices, imagine the experiences that we will be going through in 10 years from now and 20 years from now. It's a platform for the next set of applications and I think I look forward to that. So with that, I know the audience have been very patient. I'm sure some of them will have questions for yeah. you, if you don't mind. Is that, is that good? Okay. Yeah. And let's see if James, is, you want to um, get some questions from the audience? Uh, thanks very much, Roy. Big round of applause for our panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Martin, Rabbi and Thank you very much. As Roy, as Roy has said, we will now open it to Q&A. Are there any questions from the audience, Steve, Michael, or Rabbi? The problem that we had in the past one and a half years was getting uh, antenna locations, getting rental contracts, getting also non-open run, absolutely nothing to do with open run, exactly. getting rent, rental contracts on the roof, um, which is totally technology agnostic. That one we did overcome, yes. Um, we have our power co-partners ATC and Advantage now delivering and also our own um, uh, acquisitions are running pretty good. Meaning we have now, uh, end of the year, we had more than 1,000 uh, ready to deploy locations. We call it RFA, uh, ready for active installation. Um, the next step on those locations is that you mount the antenna, that's an easy one, and you bring your uh, fiber cable to the, uh, to, the, to the location. The fiber connection is done by our own company in-house, uh, Versatel, one and one Versatel, meaning we have it now in our own hands. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of time until we have the, the uh, fiber connection there. So yes, we did overcome that one, but still we are lacking uh, from, from the delay we had in getting those sites. Meaning we have more than 1,000 ready for active service and we have more than 100 now active. Which means in the course of the next months we will, we will catch up and reach the first uh, goal from the regulator, the 1,000 is the first goal from the regulator. Uh, we will reach it in the course of this year. I think we unblocked now this this antenna problem. Um, what is left is getting the fiber connection to the to the antenna. But again, that is in our hands, and we can steal it. We have there. Uh, any further questions? Yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, the gentleman over there. Thank you. Um, now you have um, open run in Germany and you just announced uh, Ukraine, is this what right? And what will be the next uh, countries in Europe on your roadmap? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, sorry, uh, Salam. Um, you is, uh, announced uh, that you will bring the Ukraine to uh, open run and you have in Germany. What are the next steps or countries on your roadmap? We <laughs> So that's a good question. The adoption has increased. I have been doing this for the last uh, four years. It started in 2020 when we launched our LTE network in April of 2020 during, during one of the most difficult human periods, I would say, in history. We launched the network. 
and I engage with hundreds and hundreds of operators, I've seen operators from Chile to, to Japan and from Canada to New Zealand and everything in between. And initially there was resistance, and I think your question is spot on. Why are we not seeing this adoption accelerate? And I believe just like everything new, if I can allude to the early cloud adoption 15 years ago, people thought we were putting data centers in the sky. I'm serious, some people thought that way. So the ability to understand this transformation in details and the value behind that transformation and how to go down and forge a path for your business to take this journey is super important. But over the last four years, my team has built a pipeline of opportunities in billions of dollars. And they span from LTE to 5G to private networks to indoor, very interesting and diverse pipeline of opportunities. And we will have additional announcements as we go through the months and the years ahead. But the industry in general have seen in the early days, in the early, I would say, 24 months, after we successfully launched and we announced with Mike and Einstein Weiss the agreement, which is a partnership agreement actually over 10 years, to build a second network in one of the most challenging markets, I would say. Japan is not easy, Germany is not easy. The, the Japanese and German consumers are so demanding and the businesses are so demanding. Now we're taking it to, you mentioned Ukraine yesterday, we made an announcement. We've had numerous announcements with tier one, tier two, tier three, in developed, underdeveloped, emerging markets. And I believe the adoption recently has gone from resistance and doubt to more understanding. We're doing a lot of that education, by the way. The some of the engineers behind you, that's my team. Our whole success and fame is on the shoulders of this amazing team and talent who has done it in Japan and then moved to Germany, the same individuals, and are doing it again. And that team has educated the industry. Now the industry is <coughs> releasing RFPs on all that. Two years ago, they didn't. Now network architecture is compared to legacy. Now TCOs are compared to legacy. This had not happened two years ago. So I am so hopeful and so optimistic about the fact that what we started in Japan, what we started in Germany together with Einstein Ice, is going to replicate and they're going to be a dominant effect and a ripple across the whole globe. There's no way, there's no other way around it. Thank you. See, what you said, the, the, the skepticism, we also had a lot of skepticism uh, against what we are doing here, even being a small company from Mondabau, right? We are having no expertise in telecom. Um, and now they start building an open one. The skepticism has gone away. It's now about curiosity, right? We get a lot of questions. How have you done it? Is it really working? Uh, and the next step after curiosity is, is action. So I believe it's, it's coming. Just would like to add for the techies in the audience that Mike and I had to defend claims that Ethernet will never work with Massive Mail. We had to defend claims that cloud will never ever be able to carry your DU and your RAM workloads, the baseband unit that is the brain of the radios. That is not an application running on a typical server you buy from any data center provider, any ODM. There were so many doubts. There were doubts about security. There were so many concerns. Energy. And we demystified energy and energy consumption. We demystified all of this. It just requires experts and very small team and individuals to go and really forge and drive this path forward. And I feel so fortunate that I have such a, an amazing team to lead this industry transformation. Thank you very much, Ravi. Any final questions from the audience? So the gentleman in the back there. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question. Do you think, do you see this technology as a path for democratization of the 5G in emerging countries, Africa and Southeast Asia country. Of course. Of course, the whole idea is to diversify, democratize, lower the barrier of entry, reduce the cost, and bring flexibility to offer better services and experiences at a lower cost. That's the formula. Really, if you remember, if somebody's recording, can you write that down? That is the formula of what the industry needs to embark on. Somebody is recording.
Yeah, I think they are. Yeah. Any final questions? Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Michael Martin, Ravi Adabusi and Roy Chua. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're taking a short break from the Booth Theatre for now. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back shortly with our next session of the day. Thank you very much. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us at the Rakuten booth. And next up, ladies and gents, we're going to be treated to one of the standout sessions of this week. We'll be hearing from Sharon Srivastava, the co-CEO of Rakuten Mobile and president of Rakuten Symphony. Sharad brings the benefit of wearing both hats. He has both played a crucial role in deploying Rakuten Mobile's network in Japan and is now exporting that expertise and technology as president of Rakuten Symphony. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to take you through our journey from 2018, and we are now in 2024, mainly focused on uh, Rakuten Mobile. And then we have a session later on, which will focus on Rakuten Symphony. So the theme for uh, this MWC is telecom reinvented, and what we are doing in last, what we have done in last five years, and what is our plan going forward. Right from 2018, we started with uh, the separate uh, industry. We started with uh, virtualization, containerization back in 2018, and uh, took the challenge of uh, ORAM. So 2020, 2022, phase one in Japan, we have uh, you know three major cities: Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and that's where we started rolling out. The rest of the nation was on uh, in collaboration with Kenya on roaming. So we focused on till 22 on rollout, and then 22-3 was uh, lean and solid management. We focused on operational efficiency, um, of course, we are remaining uh, 5G rollout. And now 2024, um, in last 20, quarter of 23, we added about a million subscribers, and uh, the aim for this year is on focuses on customer acquisition and increasing the output. When I talk about the network landscape, all these are you know coming from different vendors, but across this head -to head network, we use single software from Rakuten Symphony, and this is the biggest head -to head network I would say. Dozens of suppliers, be it small cell, uh, indoor small cells, or outdoor small cells, plus macro, 4G, 5G. Across, we use single software and single song software. In terms of 4G, today we have more than 65,000 sites, outdoor base stations, uh, and 5G we have 13,000 uh, base stations, including uh, sub-6 and millimeter wave. We started with Edge, uh, you know, when we started the building the network, we use in Japan something called Edge data centers, and we have almost more than 5,000 uh, data centers where we deploy our edge or the DU software. Then comes the regional uh, data centers where we do caching plus, uh, you know, applications like UPF and other things. And of course, the entire core sits in uh, four central CDCs. Entire, all these thousands of uh, data centers use single cloud and that's what, you know, uh, we didn't go for hybrid, we have single, we tried to minimize the SKUs and single cloud. That brings in a lot of uh, operational efficiencies. Today we have 99.9% uh, of population coverage in Japan. So almost done with the 4G rollout. Now this year we are focusing on 5G rollout. In terms of uh, RAN software availability because this is key from Symphony perspective and also from uh, Rakuten Mobile. We are at four nines in terms of software availability. We declared last quarter we are um, uh, 6.1 million subscribers. Our target for this year is between 8 to 10 million subscribers. This is, uh, you know, when the product was not ready and uh, we had high churn. Especially initially when we launched, we were offering free services. The churn rate was very high, and now we have achieved around 1.4 percent. 
which is at least one of the least in industry. And considering this is a, mostly a postpaid subscribers, this is good, big news. Uh, considering that we are just few years old, still uh, building the network, but globally, globally we have been awarded uh, as global winner for two categories by Open Signal. One is gaming experience, and the second is voice as, uh, voice app experience. And the big thing is, even though we have uh, only 20 megahertz in 1.7 on 4G side, but we won the uh, leader award for upload speed. And we won uh, high performance and the best improved network uh, for 2023. High level, as you see on the left side, uh, global winner, globally, uh, we lead on games experience in voice app and upload speed, we are number two. So what's next? What is, okay, now the network is proven, product is ready, we are focusing on customer equation, but in terms of uh, innovation, what, what are we doing? So we partnered with AST uh, a few years back, and uh, we have other partners also who invested into AST, and now we are trialing out satellite, these, these new sats, how to bring nationwide coverage. Uh, Japan, it's huge, you know, not huge as US or India, but uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, unreachable areas. Even then, we want to cover with AST. So this was successful call done from Hawaii. Second is we got 700 megahertz uh, in last year. So we are rolling out our 700 megahertz uh, platinum band is what it is called in Japan, uh, building the 700 megahertz uh, starting this year. So this will, um, of course, in rural areas we'll be using, but uh, as you know, Tokyo is very dense and deep, so it will help us uh, go in basements in other areas. Automation and AI. We right from the start, we were focused on automation and AI. We built a lot of products, uh, which we are trying to export using Symphony. But within uh, Rakuten Mobile and Rakuten as a group, we have very much focused approach on how we are going to use AI. Our target for this year, the first and foremost, is uh, on saving energy. Uh, not just on the RAN side, not just on the code side or server side, but also on RAN. How can we use AI to reduce power consumption? Then, uh, this is already implemented, customer sentiment analysis, and we use drones to site audits. So, instead of sending manpower, we use drones, and using AI, we see if there is any fault or anything has changed from the commissioner. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherrod. We will shortly be hearing again from Sherrod. But first, a quick introduction on our next session. So, we'll be hearing in detail how Rakuten is supporting AT&T, one of the world's largest brownfields with their consolidation of their site rollout software. AT&T is, of course, renowned as an innovation leader globally in telecom. So this is a very exciting session for us. It's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Igal Ilbaz, the network CTO of AT&T. Please give a big round of applause, ladies and gents. I'd also like to welcome back Sharon Srivastava, co-CEO of Rakuten Mobile and president of Rakuten Symphony. And our moderator for this session, Chetan Sharma, the CEO of Chetan Sharma Consulting. Many thanks. <laughs> Chetan, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, great to be here uh, with you, Igal, again, and, and Sharon. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, so, lots to talk about, little time, so I'll just get started. Uh, we're going to talk about operational transformation and how it fits in the AI era. Um, and uh, Sharad, you gave us a good overview of the journey of Rakuten. If you could just talk about, um, clearly from the get-go of the Rakuten mobile network, uh, automation was a key part of it. Uh, at the time, uh, Gen AI had not uh, emerged. And so, so, what are your thoughts on how you went about automation? Um, was AI, how much of AI was involved and how have you, your views changed about automation since the advent of uh, 
uh, first of all, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. sir. Um, so, automation, as I said, right from the start, right from 2018, we had uh, complete division focus on automation. I would say it is uh, AI. For example, zero touch provisioning. Right? Uh, we all these sites come as plug and play, like uh, Wi-Fi works. So that's not necessarily AI, but that was the automation that we took and we said, okay, there is no need for anyone to go to the site. It should work automatically. So that was the, the you know, in, during rollout days. Then we started using AI for an example, for RF planning, or optimization, or shop selection. Based on, because in, at least in Japan, with Rakuten ecosystem, we have 50 plus million customers coming to our system every day. We have huge database and without violating any privacy, uh, we use that data, we call it customer DNA. And based on that, many monetization techniques we are implementing there. So on the, on the network side, uh, focus is on auto RC, using AI how to teach the models. And uh, from group side also, because we started this uh, partnership with OpenAI last year, a lot of focus on network performance. Kind of leading up to that, uh, given your enormous history in the wireless industry, uh, each cycle brings its own uh, opportunities and challenges. Uh, given your uh, significant uh, announcements recently around Open RAN, uh, how do you view uh, the juncture we are at uh, in terms of uh, technology availability, uh, excitement around Open RAN, excitement around AI? How do you use those tools to uh, transform the network? We only have 45 minutes. So, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, probably let me start a little bit with what we've announced uh, late last year. We announced that we're going to accelerate the modernization of our wireless network. Uh, we've selected Ericsson to uh, go on that journey with us and we use that opportunity to announce that we're going to move into an open cloud brand uh, infrastructure. We made some bold statement about how much traffic is going to flow through this by the end of 2026. 70% of our traffic is going to flow through open architecture. And we have different definition of what open and cloud means. It's open hardware, it's migration into cloud RAN, it's the introduction of third-party radios, and it's the ability to use a management layer that no matter which vendor you're using, you own it's one management layer that allows you to bring some ideas of AI, automation, and other stuff uh, that you mentioned. We're pretty excited about the transition. I, earlier this week, we announced our first call over the Ericsson Cloud RAN in our commercial network, so that was an interesting and important milestone for us. In terms of the timing, uh, clearly we face a little bit of different challenges. Uh, Rakuten was kind of the poster child of Open RAN for right from the beginning, they had the advantage of building a scratch, a network from scratch, a greenfield, generally speaking, different challenges from having an established network, um, migrating into cloud run and open run, but you always look, every operator is practically trying to look what is the right moment for them to do that transition. Some of this starts with the maturity of the ecosystem, is the specification mature enough? Is there enough vendor ecosystem? If you think about the cloud aspects of this, is the energy or the capacity that comes out of a general purpose platform is at the, is at the level that you want? So if you feel that all of those things are in place, then you, are, you can start migrating into that process. And this is where we feel. We felt that this is the right time for us. We know what we're doing, we have a lot of experience on introducing uh, new and open technologies into our network, and we felt that we are at the time that it's actually the time for us to start and, uh, doing that migration. So, you want to... Yeah, so, I want to talk about um, the work that you guys are doing together. Yeah. Um, so, maybe you can expand, first expand on and educate us on what the specific problem areas or opportunity areas you are working on, and then I'll go deeper into uh, questions, so anybody can start. Sure, I'll start. Uh, we, have a, we have a project called the Network Simplification Transformation. Uh, 
you know, we keep talking about Open RAN and Cloud RAN and all of the excitement of the architecture, but the real life is actually building the network. For sure, in the size of a network, our size, uh, nationwide in North America, that takes a lot of effort, a lot of planning. And uh, we were at the point that that process of uh, site build and design required us traversing several systems that many of them were out there for many years. And so Rakuten Symphony were, Rakuten, with Rakuten Symphony were kind enough to come and help us with that. Uh, they looked at the problem and they said, hey, we think we can introduce agility and capabilities in that space. And we said, okay, let's see, what can we do together? And uh, honestly, to our uh, great surprise, we've made a lot of progress. Uh, this is typical projects that may take three to five years in a company our size. Rakuten were able to show us in 18 months a lot of benefits. Uh, we've migrated already to, from the old system into the new one. Uh, we're adding all kind of digitalization of our site to drone and everything is fed up into that system. So we give access not only to our designers, but you know, we work with their vendors. Everyone get access to the same view through iPads. And so uh, we're very excited about this. We actually now thinking about where else we can extend that capabilities in other parts of where we're doing engineering and build. So, we're pretty excited about this, and thank you for the great work that you've done with us. Uh, thank you, Carl, for that. And before we talk about transformation, again, thanks for the open RAN. That is the biggest push in industry for open RAN. I would say. Okay, we have launched, and there are a few networks on open RAN, but from coming from at and is the biggest thing. So that's in the right direction from entire telecom perspective, I would say. Uh, coming to the transformation project, it's a uh, site manager and uh, we have now basically deployed in all the markets of at and and we have maybe 6,000 users now. So, and trying to integrate and you know, other applications on top of this. So for the users, it's single window. Right? This has entire inventory management, which is key. And as of now, as Hiroi Gal was mentioned, Yeah, so it's a, you know, mainly the construction team yeah. Yeah, and the partners yeah. and slowly it will be you know, also getting into uh, site equation team and RF planning team. Yeah. So could you just touch upon uh, the process of getting the data in and how much work was on the platform side to, to analyze it and get it in the form where it can be used? Was it uh, something that you had already used at Rakuten Mobile and that's why it was easy for you? Or would you just shed some light on the so, process? Yeah, two things. Uh, of course, in Rakuten Mobile, we have been using the same tool uh, for site accept and site rollout. We have various, uh, but it is used end-to-end, -end, which is not used here. For example, for us, even the all the drive testing acceptance, cluster acceptance, market acceptance is done on the same tool. Um, we are not there yet, you know, we, because it's huge. It, 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 those are huge, and we have to go one by one. But the same tool um, is used by Nokia in 90 countries. But uh, that was first generation. This is much more advanced. And that one touch would be, once we complete and we transform, this is, you know, basic requirement for AI to work. Yeah. Because unless you have data at one place, AI won't work. So. It has not started, but we are working with the Gulf team. Uh, how can we implement basic things? For example, uh, you know, which contracting company or contractor is performing well? Uh, and we have all the inventory data. There are so many insights which can be generated, which is not done yet, but that's planned for this year. So, uh, this was, I mean, this was going from, you know, when people used to talk about Rocket and Mobile, though, a lot of the incumbents will, around the world will say, oh, it's a greenfield operator, and shrug it. Um, but this example shows that a lot of the capabilities that were built for a greenfield operation can can be adopted for um, an operator of that complexity and size as at t So kind of 
going into other functions uh, within the operations. So uh, RF planning or uh, doing things like uh, uh, you know checking the network on a constant basis. Like where, where do we go from next? Like what's the limit in terms of the capabilities that you have built for your own network can be transformed onto an existing network? So uh, as I said, uh, you know, it was greenfield. It was greenfield network. We could do whatever we wanted to do, and we had our own OSs. We had our own RAM. We had our own cloud. So for us to implement anything was, you know, very easy. But uh, you know, uh, talking about ATMD, there are people who have been there for 20 years using the same tool. Uh, for them to adopt a new thing will take some time. So, but we are working on that direction slowly. So right now, it is just the site manager or uh, rollout manager, it can, you know, next level will be RF, maybe, you know, next level would be, could be, finally when we integrate any, everything, it can run uh, planning, RF planning, prediction, optimization and performance management. So this is just the start, we can, you know, it will take some time, but that's the journey. The important thing to understand is that in the project that we've done together, Rakuten were able to prove us that they can scale their platforms to our needs if we decide to do or take advantage of other parts of the platform that they build. They prove that they can scale it and if we get to that point, I'm sure they'll do that. In terms of um, you know, the success factors of the project, from your team's point of view, what do you think, I mean, clearly they brought into the table the capabilities you have to do some changes on your end to make sure that project is successful and is completed in a timely fashion? Yes, um, again, um, I think we've been introduced with the level of agility that we needed and I think typically one of the biggest challenges in such transformation is people used to what they used to and they've been working on some of those systems for many years and it worked well and changing people's habits even if the neuron may look or feel better is not easy uh, but I think that you know all of us in the network organization we felt it's important we put the right leadership attention into this and I think uh, the moment people see the value, the ease of use, the benefits they can get of this, the full visibility, the efficiencies that come out of this, then it's much easier. So if you don't get to that point, and if it's just PowerPoints and conversation, the moment you get to the point where actual users are seeing the value, uh, I'll tell you a secret, like uh, nothing happens in our company just because we said, like we need to prove the value to the users. And if they see the value, they'll use it. And I think uh, Shah and the team were able to uh, demonstrate that capabilities and show the value to the users. So another you know, top, the topic here at, at the show is, is AI, Gen AI, and everything encompassing it. From your vantage point, um, how do you see AI impacting operations um, and a network? where you can start to see tangible benefits. I mean, there's a lot of uh, rule-based analysis that gets done that tagged as AI, but clearly the network and operations have a tremendous amount of data that can be trained to do things that you want to automate. So you all from a network, from a network engineering point of view, how do you see AI benefiting this transformation? So let's take a step back because there's a lot of conversation about AI and Gen AI. Clearly it's not new for us at at and Go back to the 50s, you know where this was invented. Uh, but even if to the conversation today, uh, I'm looking at AI in our industry in three dimensions. One is, you know, telcos are companies like any other companies. We have customer service, we have marketing, we have software development, uh, we have sales. So the same tools and the same capabilities that can be used in any other company in the universe can be used by us. We've done, uh, we have a great chief data office team at at and and they were first movers in that space. They took advantage of the fact that we have a lot of uh, 
data, machine learning, and AI knowledge in the company, as well as our relationship with Microsoft to quickly create a fully secure, isolated environment in Azure that allows us to upload our data and bring all kinds of models and create what we call Ask at and which is our own version of Gen AI that we can use to all kind of things inside of at and again, like hopefully any other company in the world. So that's number one. Number two, if you think about wireless network, AI is now being part of the standard, the way you think about network, when you think about capacity planning or uh, spectral efficiency or energy efficiency or cost efficiencies, AI can help with all of this and it's literally being part uh, of the standards with 5G advance and uh, we're going to see this evolving over time. It's actually part of layer one and all I'm sure you know this in Rakuten, there's concept like uh, real-time controller, near real-time, not non-real-time, like SMO, these are all platforms that allows you to bring AI on top of our wireless network. The third one is actually, do we need our own models? You're right. Uh, operators, when we engineer and operate the network, we generate a lot of content, a lot of uh, documents. Great opportunity for us to see how we can do that differently, how we can do uh, desk scripts, um, and there's no doubt that all of us are interested to move to a higher level of automation when we run our network. It depends on the fact that you have a well open, established network, you know how to collect the data, uh, you know how to run models on top of this, and you do this gradually. Our networks are very sensitive, it's mission critical, so our ability to introduce this gradually over time in a, in a way that we feel pretty confident that if we allow uh, things to be automated, they end up in the right outcome is really important. So you're going to see each one of us at its own pace get to that level of confidence to allow us to uh, take more and more advantage uh, of automation, but we're clearly very excited about this. We've been, I'm not going to go through all of the things that we've done over the years, but we've been uh, highly involved and uh, proactive in terms of uh, introducing machine learning and AI and automation now. You're at uh, a very unique position of not only uh, getting the network data, but also data about other activities about the customer on your vast number of properties. How are you thinking about using AI to uh, to understand the customer first and then engage with them at multiple levels? Well, a um, few things. Uh, last year we decided, and not just Rakuten Mobile, but group-wide we have targets, measurable targets. And the first KPIs is every group company, we have 72 group companies, every group company is targeted to reduce operational costs by 20%. Every software engineer is using what is available today, made you know, chat GPT, Copilot, or whatever. Everybody is equipped with this. We have AI for Octavians, uh, which is enforced across all the group companies. Plus, now we are giving it to merchants and customers. So, at least in Japan market, uh, we are thinking to give it all of our customers at very subsidized cost. And with the merchants for B2B, it's already in place. Second thing was, as Igal mentioned, you know, uh, everybody has marketing cost, sales cost, customer support cost. So across there, we wanted to reduce it by 20%. And third was the enabler, which is not specifically for Rakuten Mobile or Rakuten Symphony, but uh, for the ecosystem, how do we enable our merchants? We have thousands of merchants and partners uh, because we have banks and e-commerce. How do we enable them uh, to use AI? With all this, this said, uh, we collect a lot of data, we call it customer DNA. Across, uh, we basically know most of the things about customer, where he goes, where he lives, what's, you know, uh, because we have insurance, we can say, okay, um, this because, and we have mobility data. So if the person is driving at a high speed, we, we may decide, okay, for his automobile insurance should be higher, right? Or if someone is awake till 3 a.m. Uh, at a bar, 
we can say, okay, please, our insurance company, please raise the life insurance or don't give it. So things like that. We are correlating all this data because we have that data. AI will not work without data, no matter what. Right? So the richness of data is very important. Are we doing any um, audience questions? Um, Are there any questions from the audience for any of our panelists? <laughs> so, thank, thank you uh, for your uh, very, very informative uh, discussion. In, in terms of you using AI and big data to improve your network, what traffic data uh, Traffic data is huge data. How do you extract useful data from all your huge traffic to actually put AI, AI algorithm to work and to try to improve the network? Do you, do you already do this? How do you do this? What do you use to do this? Can you comment on that? So I'll give you one example um, because I spoke about that power efficiency. So, uh, in order to do power efficiency, we have tons of thousands of servers right, in the network and many radio sites. We need to just get the traffic data. Out of all the data, traffic data, how many users are there, what is the traffic carried. If at night there is no one in this building, which is where we have deployed indoor system, for example, we can switch off the data. Right? So, things like that. For, this is one example where just the traffic data is required. If it is rural or suburban areas, we have multiple bands, we can switch off one band. If we are operating uh, per wipe four, we can convert to two by two, based on traffic data and customer experience. Great. 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 Uh, maybe one final question I'll ask is uh, around uh, network APIs, because that's a big topic here. And at and is clearly involved, has been involved for a long time. So what's the, what's the promise and how do we get it right this time? Uh, the promise is simple. Uh, if you go 10 years back, we launched 4G, great networks, a lot of investment. At the same time, all kinds of applications and services and value was created on top of the network. And we didn't find, collectively as an industry, we didn't find a way uh, to benefit. And uh, fast forward into 5G, first of all, there's big differences between how Telco looks today than what it was um, a decade ago, I think we are much more, we have a much deeper understanding of cloud infrastructure and software and what is an API and how to work with developers and networks are much more open. Part of the standards in 5G, there's function that it's all sole purpose in the standalone code is to expose APIs. And we all remember that we missed the opportunity. In LD. So I think if you take all of this learning and the maturity that we went through in terms of our ability to work in that environment and the pace of that environment, I think we are much well established to take advantage in the next wave of innovation. Because this new, uh, new cycle of innovation will come, whether it's AR, autonomous cars, or any other additional use cases that will uh, emerge you think there's a couple of things that are, are common into them. They are much more real time. They require much more uh, reliable <laughs> networks in terms of consistency of the experience. And I think we can deliver on all of this. And I think we're very uniquely positioned in offer those capabilities. And I think what you're seeing is, uh, for an example, the open gateway is a great example of uh, with the GSMA having all of us operator to say, hey, this is important. Do you agree? And we all said, yes, we agree. And to, it's very surprising. We're actually working well together. In a year, there's several dozens of operators that joined as API through Kamara that are getting exposed. So we know how to work better together. We know how to move fast. And we have great assets in terms of edge essay and other stuff that we can explore that can benefit developers and if developers in the past were thinking well the network probably let me develop a lot of algorithm and intelligence into the app 
to kind of walk around the network. We're getting to the point where anyone in the audience who wants to develop an app that require this can just develop through the network. That's a huge, huge difference, and I think we are very well positioned to capture on that value. Any uh, final words, Gerard? I think he covered everything. And uh, just on top of that, Nick and NW Dab, which are, you know, that will be critical as well in this year. I believe we have one question from the gentleman, yes. Um, hi. It, it sounds like a, a marquee announcement that's come through today. Um, is this considered material for Rakuten Symphony? And would you, is it the start of beautiful friendship with more to come potentially? Sorry, which announcement? Sorry, today, the, the Rakuten Symphony is uh, helping AT&T at uh, uh, a potentially quite significant scale. Should this be considered a, a significant deal for, for Rakuten Symphony and with more potential to come? Or is it just a, an update on, on, on something that's already been factored in? Yeah, this is not an announcement, uh, you know. This is a six, uh, now we are running this program for one and a half year. Um, this is just to reiterate how successful we are, how we are closely working. And as Igal mentioned, how agile our team is on-site and off-site, um, both in US and you know remote. So that's a start. That was start of with one product suite, and we have many more to go. So, uh, are there any further questions from the audience? Ladies and gentlemen, give a very big hand to our panelists: Igal Elbaz, Network CTO of at and Sharon from the start, the co CEO of Rapids and Mobile Man, President of Rapids and Tiffany, and our, and our moderator, Chetan Sharma. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings a close to today's booth theatre sessions at the Rapids booth. Thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.